every light on your dashboard means something. Today we diagnose a few of those warning lights and bring back the 72 Chevy for some TLC. Hey, welcome to Truck U. You know, a lot of times you notice when you're out driving around, a lot of lights can come on potentially on your dash, and they are there for a reason. They're gonna tell you if you've got some kind of issue going on with one of your systems in your truck. I mean, it could be any number of things. The thing is, it really doesn't give you any direction to go with, because it could be so many different things wrong for that check engine light to come on. Right. You know, one of the issues we're experiencing right now in this truck is the ABS lights on. Yep. That's a pretty good indicator, at least gives us a narrowed down idea of what we're talking about, you know, something with the braking system. Now, the other thing that can go wrong and what's happening with this truck is the fuel gauge. You know, it's intermittent. It's, it's not giving us, or at least a steady reading, if it was, right. you know, well, well, it's an eighth of the tank and then it's a half a tank and then it's zero and then it's back full again, you know there's going to be a problem. It's not what you want to have, especially if you're about to go on a road trip or something. No, we could get stranded any moment now, so maybe we shouldn't go too far. Yeah, right? I think maybe we should turn around and get back to the shop <laughs> and we can get this thing diagnosed, you know, run the scan tool, find out what's happening. With the truck back in the shop, we can hook up the scan tool and hopefully start getting a head start on what exactly is going on. Now, we noticed driving down the road that the ABS light was on and also the fuel gauge was whacked out. Sometimes it was showing full, sometimes it was empty. We know there's plenty of fuel in here, so we've got an issue with that as well, too. So the code that came up says that it was the rear ABS sensor. Now, that's pretty common on these particular vehicles. The good news is it's right on the rear differential. It's easy to get to, so all we have to do is get this up on the lift. Now Matt was getting a code for a rear ABS sensor, so before you get back here and you start tearing stuff apart, do yourself a favor, take a minute and do a visual inspection real quick. First thing, look at the obvious. If you've got a mismatched tire or real low tire pressure, that could give you a false code. That's not the case right here, but it's something to look for. The other thing you want to do is check the wiring going to that ABS sensor. You want to trace it along the frame rail here. See if you've got a situation, you've got a crimp wire or one that's been pinched or chafed or rubbed through. It could be grounding out on the chassis. That's not a good thing, and that could be the problem right there. Once again, not the scenario here, so we're going to dig a little deeper. What you do is unplug this sensor, and you'll read, uh, read the ohms of that sensor and check for resistance. Now, the way this whole system works with an ABS sensor, and this truck for one, is it's got one for that whole back axle. Now, some vehicles have them independently left and right. This one is just reading off of the drive shaft. What it's doing is there's a tone ring inside the ring and pinion, and this uh, magnetic sensor, what it's doing is counting the teeth going around and how fast they're going, giving you an idea of when you lock up the rear brakes here, it'll sense it, send a code up to the computer and tell you to get your foot off the brake pedal by pulsing that brake pedal. So that ABS sensor is doing the work for you. Now the way you check to see if it's working is, once again, you want to check the resistance through that sensor. So what we'll do is look for a reading that's above 2500 ohms. If it is, we know the sensor is bad. And, you know, it's the sensor and not the circuit. That's exactly what the scenario is here. So at this point, all you have to do is replace the sensor. It's pretty easy to do. You grab yourself a new one from Delphi. They're great because these things are 100% tested to the most extreme conditions. And these contacts right here, they are plated to avoid corrosion and will help these things last for a long period of time. So you put one Delphi sensor in, you don't have to worry about it ever again. So the first issue has been resolved and the ABS deal is taken care of. Nice work, we don't have to worry about that anymore, right? Now upon further scanning, we got another code and that told us that there was an issue with the fuel sending unit. That's what was whacking out our gauge up there. So we know where the problem is. Yeah, that's the good thing. We know where the problem is, and that's the bad thing because we know where the problem is. <laughs> the problem lies inside this fuel tank with that fuel level sender, and it's not easy to get to, as you can imagine. We had to get this whole fuel tank down. It's rather cumbersome. That's why rather than just replacing that fuel level sender, at this point, we're going to go ahead and replace the whole fuel pump with the new hangar fuel pump assembly from Delphi. You see, this truck's got over 100,000 miles on it. It's creeping up on 10 years. It's about time to just do the whole thing at this point. Now. 
Delphi makes a direct factory replacement for this. So we'll get this ready to go in. And the cool thing is this particular fuel pump is made with patented Gen 4 turbine pump technology. What that means is if a small piece of sediment or junk were to get past here and get into the pump, that turbine technology spins it all around so that little piece of junk will get cast off to the side and it's like an extra cleaning step for the fuel before it gets sent up to the engine. It also uses less power, so there's less power draw, and it operates under higher pressure, so that's good for quick startups right there. It's like getting an upgraded fuel system for an old truck, really. And you talk about upgrades too, there's a couple other benefits about this pump that are great from Delphi. One is the Packard OE wiring. It's going to maintain its integrity for a long period of time because it's a superior wire and it sits down in that fuel tank. So if you use an inferior wire, what it'll do is it'll, it'll short out or it'll lose its integrity over the course of time and prematurely ruin your pump. So that's taken care of. And one thing you want to talk about too is in keeping its integrity is the, uh, the hanger itself is made of stainless steel so it won't corrode and it'll last longer. Hopefully it'll give us a couple hundred thousand miles before we have to do something like this ever again. Right, and now here is where the issue was. Yeah, right? you know, the fuel level center, what happens is, you know, when it goes bad and which happens in these pumps is the fact that it starts losing its resistance at variable times throughout the travel. So what was happening, it was whacked out, as Matt would say. Right. I got very technical. <laughs> it would have resistance, then lose it, and then pick it back up again. So putting in a new one will solve that problem. We get this pump, back, pump in the tank and we get this tank back in the truck. Okay, so the new gasket comes with the pump and it's clocked. You can only lay that in one way and then we'll slide the pump in here. We'll get that in there and it's nice. It's kind of foolproof. You can only hook it up one way. So all of our lines will be right there. Boom, that's where it needs to be, right? Welcome back to Truck U. Now today we've been talking about error codes and those pretty little lights that come up on your dash, you know the ones you don't want to see. One of the most common lights that you don't want to see is the check engine light. And one of the most common sources of that is a P300 error code. And really what throws that up a lot is an issue with the ignition coil. You know, we talk about ignition coils, it's a great opportunity for us to kind of take you well, I'll back a step and talk about the evolution of the coil. In 1909 was the first type of ignition coil, and that was a distributor type system. And it's something that's prevalent in NASCAR today, and I actually want to run one in my drag race car. Now, the way the whole system works is you've got a single coil, which is feeding spark to a distributor, which does exactly what you would think. It distributes the spark to the entire engine. Now, this is how it works is in this application, you have the distributor slide in through the top of the engine, and it's been driven in a circle like this off of the camshaft. So as this is turning, you've got this rotor up here which is turning. Now in your car all you're going to see is the top on like that but if you look inside you see what's happening is as the engine turns around this rotor is turning it's distributing spark to each one of these posts here which is going out through a spark plug wire to each individual cylinder. The good thing about it is, well, you can make some power. The bad thing is it's not really that efficient. You know, you talk about it, plug wires. The length of those wires, you've got more opportunity to lose spark, to lose energy, to lose ignition. And that's not a good thing. Now, mechanically speaking, there's a couple things you have to have intact for it to work correctly. You've got to have this timed correctly into the engine. If you don't, it'll misfire. If you do something as simple as across a plug wire, it'll misfire as well. You know, Come to think of it, I don't even know why I run one of these things. There's a lot going on with that, right? <laughs> right around 1985, some guys were hanging out saying, we have got to take this and make it more efficient. And that's what came about with the direct ignition system. Now, this was nice because one coil could run two cylinders, right? So they didn't have to work as hard. Then, basically, this was electronically driven, not mechanical. So it's not being driven by the cam anymore, so it's not going to rob any power of the right. engine. So that was the idea. You know, the next step in the evolution was really to make it a little bit smaller, not take any power from it and run it electronically. And this was a good step in the right direction. Now in 1995, things evolved to the ignition cassette as you can see right here. Now the whole advantage to this is you've got a very short amount of time and space that the spark has to travel. You've got less opportunity to lose spark and lose energy. Now the drawbacks to this is the fact that, well, they're specific to each particular engine and each particular application. The other thing too is if one of these coils goes bad, you've got to change out the whole system, which can be expensive and kind of a bit of a pain, to be honest with you. Sure, so that same group of people, or maybe some different guys, were hanging out going, you know, we're tired of junking this whole thing because one went bad, so we're going to go to this, the next step in the evolution. And it's a coil near plug is what they were calling that. And the coil is right there. If this went bad, all you had to do was replace this one and not this whole unit. 
Now, keeping with that theme of lighter, smaller, better, shorter, <laughs> you got the pencil coil, which came about in 2001. It's prevalent in a lot of passenger cars you'll see today and trucks. And as you can see, it's physically smaller than the other one. And the whole idea, once again, you've got less opportunity for it to lose spark, less opportunity for it to lose energy. And, you know, you only need one per cylinder. So you, what you do is if one goes bad, you don't have to worry about junking the whole system like you did here. Right. You have that loss of power through all those wires and that whole system like you had here. And I'm starting to think the coil evolved over time and it's gotten smaller and better and lighter and faster. And I'm still running something like this. You know I what? wonder why I got killed last week. I'm no crew chief, but the coil has evolved and it might be time for you to evolve as well, my friend. Yeah, I think something the, to the, think about. The B-Man needs to evolve as well. So we're back out on the road with this 2003 Ford F-150. We've done the diagnostics, we've done the fix, and I think we've got the problem fixed. The ABS light's off, so the sensor was bad. That was an easy one to fix, thanks to Delphi. The other thing is the fuel uh, gauge is reading correctly. We put a few gallons of gas in it. It looks like it's making some sense for a change. At least it's not jumping around. So now I think we can have some fun. Hey, you mentioned earlier about the check engine light coming on and the fact that the lights can be a little bit vague from time to time, you know? Well, here's the deal is the check engine light will come on and it can be any number of things. And a lot of times it's something simple like the gas cap isn't right. screwed on tight. So before you haul it off to the shop and spend the money getting it checked, go ahead and make sure your gas cap is on nice and tight. If it's not, you put it on, drive it around for about another day or so, maybe another 24 hours, and just see if that fixes the problem. Sometimes it will. Like It's like a little dummy light, which there is a dummy light, a gas cap light, on this particular truck, which is cool. Yeah, that is cool. But if you don't have one, just put it on there, make sure it's tight, drive it around and see if that fixes it before you haul it off to the shop. So now that we're done with this truck, we actually have a little bit of time for some projects of our own, and we can get back to the shop and get to work on that 72 Chevy. One of our things? Yeah. Nice. Hey, welcome back in the shop here today is a 72 Chevy truck and it's a project truck we work on when we get the time. Now today we've been talking a lot about fuel pumps and fuel systems. It kind of ties into what we're going to do to this thing here today. We're going to put a new fuel tank in it from Brothers Truck Parts. We're going to put some new fuel lines from Gates. But before we get to the fuel stuff, and while we're up front, we're going to put a brand new serpentine belt in from Gates. And this thing obviously needs one. Yeah, we're going to replace that non-existent belt with a brand new one. You know what's interesting about belts? Over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of technological advances. You'd have had the old neoprene style belts which were good for up to 50 60,000 miles they held up pretty good and you could tell when they were wearing because you could look down there and they'd start breaking apart little chunks flying out and you said hey time to change the belt right well now you've got the EPDM construction and these hold up much longer we're talking 100,000 miles or 100,000 plus we've got one right here with 150,000 miles on this belt and you look doesn't look that bad but with 150,000 miles on it, that has got to go. What we're gonna do is go with the Micro-V Advanced Technology Belt. That's gonna work good for this particular application. Now, you look down the Gates product line, if we wanted to go a little bit heavier duty, we could go with this green Fleet Runner belt right here, or for more of a racing application, we could go with the blue. But this one's gonna work here. You just have to not destroy my hands. Oh, you don't preferably. trust me? Well, I don't know, maybe, maybe a little bit. I'm having some issues though. Just keep it where it's at, all right. It's on. Good? Yeah, looking All right. good. All right, cool. Here you go. We made our way to the back of the right. truck to start addressing some of those fueling issues that we mentioned a few minutes ago. And the first place we're going to start is these old rubber fuel lines. If you can see this, you can tell that these things are starting to crack and they're old and stiff in braille and that's not a good thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to replace the old ones that have been in this truck for over 40 years with some new stuff from the guys at Gates. It's their barricade line. Now, one of the issues besides this being just an old hose is the fact that it wasn't made in the day of the modern era of fuel we're running today. You know, we've got these aggressive fuels today. We've got the ethanol, the gasohol, biodiesel, E85, all this stuff is really aggressive. And what I'm referring to is it tears down and it breaks down the inside of the fuel line. And then you cause contaminants because those pieces of fuel line get flushed through your entire fuel system and it, that results in damage. So it'll clog up your fuel pump, it'll give you a shortage of fuel delivery, which the end result being damage to the engine, which is not a good thing. So if I go ahead and replace it with the barricade line from Gates, well, we don't have to worry about that anymore. And they've got a set made for carbureted applications as well as a higher pressure set that'll handle all the needs of the guys with high uh, fuel pressure with electronic fuel injection. Now, here's another thing to think about. Out in California, they've got an organization called the California Air Resources Board, and they set the minimum standards for permeation. And a lot of other states are following suit and doing what California's doing. 
Permeation is actually the evaporation of hydrocarbon vapors through your fuel line. So think about it like this. You've got two feet of your average fuel hose. Over the course of a year, it'll permeate one gallon of those hydrocarbon vapors. That same two feet of barricade fuel hose will only permeate two tablespoons of hydrocarbon vapors. So you can see it's got the lowest permeation rate in the industry. And that's a good thing because I don't think most people are sitting around the dinner table thinking about <laughs> permeation and thinking about the evaporation of hydrocarbon you know, vapors through their fuel lines, but now you don't even really have to think about it at all, right? And that's a good thing. Now, you get those ready? Yeah. All right, we'll get these lines in place and then we can drop in that new fuel tank. This is cool. Welcome back to Truck U. Now take a look at this. This is the commercial grade heavy duty truck box from RKI and it's constructed entirely of 14 gauge steel. So this baby right here is going to hold up. And it's going to look good because it's got a great powder coating finish in either white or black. It's got cool features on the sides. You've got these full size stainless steel handles on either end which allow you to get easy access to the inside of the box from either side. Right. Now you look inside, you've got some compartments to store all your stuff. It comes complete with weather stripping that's going to go all the way around to make sure that all the elements stay out of the inside of this box. And RKI backs it up with a lifetime warranty as well. I told you this thing's going to last though, so when you're ready to trade in the truck, you'll be taking this out of the old one and sticking it in the new one. As of today, floor mats are being taken to an entirely new level and it all happens right here with the Catch It Premium Floor Protection from the guys at Nifty Products. Now they effectively contain your mess and your spills and the way they do that is because you've got the double raised ridges through the center yep. and around the perimeter so whatever mess you make stays on the mat. Now if you look at the back side of the mat you've got all these nibs more than anybody in the industry and what that does it keeps the mat in place so the mat stays in place, the mess stays in place and it keeps off of your floor. It's great for kids, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Hey here's another exclusive that they've got right here to the catch it system. It's the first all weather carpeted floor mat right there so the same deal you pull that out you rinse it off, just clean it just like you do these and throw it right back in and you don't have to worry about all the mildew and all that nonsense. Now all these mats are molded, they're specific for your application and they've got more applications than anybody else so you know when you get one of these it'll fit your vehicle and it'll go right in place. It's the Catch It Premium Floor Protection System from the guys at Nifty Products. This is the line of protectants from Black Magic. Now the best part about it is you've got options. If you want to go with option A, it's the Pro Shine. This is the one I like because it's going to keep these pieces looking shiny and wet. That's the finish that I go with, man. That's how I roll. Whether it's leather, plastic, vinyl, or rubber, you know, it's going to keep these pieces and parts looking brand new. And it's got fade block, which is the UV blocker, so there's the protection. Now, if you prefer more of a matte finish, you've got the natural finish to protect it. Now, it'll work in all the same places as the Pro Shine, but this is going to give you that nice matte look, plus the addition of having an anti static dust guard technology. What that does is repel dust and lint from accumulating on your interior, keeping it looking cleaner longer. Now, this has also got got a UV absorber and a light stabilizer which prevent drying, cracking and fading. So whether it's the natural finish protectant or the Pro Shine protectant, the Black Magic is going to keep all of your pieces and parts looking great. For more information about anything you've seen on today's show, check out speed.com or visit our website at truckutv.com. This segment of Truck U is brought to you by Cars.com, where confidence comes standard. Today we're back at the engine shop and interestingly enough, you know, carbon deposits and carbon buildup can actually rob your engine of a lot of performance and those buildups and those deposits can happen on any number of parts, man. Yeah, you know, you'll see it often in your pistons and in your valves and inside your, your ports of your head. And this is where all the power is really made. You've got your combustion chamber, which needs to be properly sealed. When you've got carbon buildup like this, you lose that combustion chamber seal and you lose the efficiency of your engine. An easy way to combat that is simply pouring Z-Max into your engine. 
In fact, we did a little experiment right here where we took the Z-Max and poured it in and we heated it up to 180 degrees to simulate the operating temperature of your engine. Then we put the carbon in there and you can see it's just getting destroyed. This carbon's getting dispersed all over the place. Everything's getting cleaned up. And the good part about this is if you have existing carbon deposits, the Z-Max will take care of those and clean them up. And it will also soak into the metal because it's a micro lubricant and that will prevent the carbon from sticking there in the future. Now keep in mind that Z-Max works with the hot and cold cycles of your engine, so you're going to pour it in, let it run for about 500 miles, let it soak into the metal, disperse all that carbon away, and get your engine running like new again. Now if you've got a new engine, pour in that Z-Max, the same thing will happen, it'll soak into the metal, but it'll keep all those carbon deposits from sticking to your parts. Just one more way that Z-Max will keep you going down the road. Hey, welcome back. We got a lot of work done today, knocked out a couple projects and started to get ahead above water. Right. Then a buddy of ours dropped off his newest project, or our newest <laughs> project. He's going to start his own business as being a road ranger. And around here, what that means is he's going to be the guy who's going to give you roadside assistance. You know, you get a flat tire, you run out of fuel, battery, any of that stuff. He's going to come out the side of the road and he's going to save your butt. So he's ready to roll. The only thing is, he doesn't have a truck to put it in. Yeah, he just mentioned that to us too. He said, hey guys, here's the only stumbling block. I've got to get a vehicle, right? And he thought, you know, I'm going to go to these guys and see if he can hook us up, get me a deal or anything like that. And we said, look, you've got a couple of different options. We can go out and pound the pavement for a couple of days looking for a good deal, or we can sit right here on the computer in the air conditioned room and log on to cars.com and find exactly what we need. It is simple. We logged right on. We're thinking F-250 is the direction that he wants to go, right? right. We want the long bed on it as well. So we found four. Ford F-250, we hit search, and it brought up a bunch of them. We searched for 30 miles around this zip code, and it gave us a lot of different options here. And as soon as you pull that up, the great thing is, now there's even more options right there on the left. I mean, you can really kind of narrow down the search for price, mileage, year, style, exterior color, drivetrain, you know, the engine, gas versus diesel, whatever you want. You've got all the options right there, and you can narrow it down in seconds, man. You know, white is one of the things that has to be so this thing will stand out on the side of the road, so click on that. Okay. So you get that, right? And so we see the truck that we want. And you've got other options on there, too. So you can read about the guys that actually own this. There's professional reviews, and there's reviews from the people that own these vehicles. So you can get everybody's opinion on how the vehicle is, what they like about it, what they don't. Well, right here, I'm seeing one that's close by, and it's got that V10 in it. Now, it's gas, and that's a good gas engine. Right. It'll save a bunch of money up front versus going with the diesel. And it looks like a pretty good price. That's at a dealership, too. Let's take this to him, run it by him, tell him that we recommend this, and then maybe go make this deal happen. Yeah, because I don't think this one's going to last. No, I don't think so. That's going to go. We might actually buy that one if he doesn't. Yeah. Buy it.